Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Suzanne Miller, and I am a principal researcher in the SEI Software Solutions Division. My guest for today's podcast I'm pleased to bring in is Aaron Greenhouse, a senior architect researcher also in our Software Solutions Division. And today we're going to be talking about 11, not 10, not 12, but 11 rules for ensuring a security model, specifically by automating security with the Architecture Analysis and Design Language, AADL, and the Bell, I think it's Lapadula, but it could also be Lapadula model. Um, If anybody wants to give us a correction, let us know. Uh, Welcome, Aaron. I'm so glad to see you again. So, hi. It's good to be here. So I want to start off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do here. We have a lot of viewers that may be interested in sort of the kind of work we do. So we want to let them know a little bit about what's it like to work at the SEI and what kinds of stuff do you work on as a researcher here? So as you said, my name is Aaron Greenhouse. I have a doctorate in computer science, Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, after I was graduated, I came to actually I came to work at SEI back in 2004 Uh, I was here for about three years uh, left in 2007 Um, and I came back uh, in 2017 Um, so that's a interesting uh, career path I think at SEI Um, what made you come back to the SEI after being out in industry for a while um, well honestly the not so started up startup that I was in. It chugged along for 10 years and then came to an end. So uh, that is why I came back. <laughs> Very practical. <laughs> so what kind of work do you do here um, You know, as a researcher? Uh, I've, I've been working both kind of on the practical end of things, trying to make the OSATE uh, uh, ADL development environment. I work on that. Um, and uh, that's actually, I worked on that 15 years ago. I still work on it now. Um, and then it's I work- evolved quite a bit. I, then I work on the, trying to see how we can make use of ADL in, in the real world. And that's kind of where this work uh, springs out of, which, uh, actually, again, this work actually started back in 2006, I think. And uh, we, uh, was, yeah, it was turned into a conference paper. I think it had a part of an old version of it was presented at the conference in 2008. And then uh, kind of sat on the shelf, but uh, now it's back. Uh, because ADL, it's time has come. Yeah, well, ADL evolved since then, and uh, security is always a hot issue. So we decided to re- re- revitalize it. Okay. So we have audience members who may not be familiar with AADL. We do have a lot of published work on that topic going back a long time, um, and. We will include links to that work in the transcript, but the the La Padula model, can you give us a little overview of that and its relationship to AADL and sort of what was the catalyst to combine it with AADL? Um, I'm try to give a brief summary of what that's all about. Um, so the Bell, the Padula or La Padula, again, we don't know how to pronounce his last name, which is kind of embarrassing. But uh, uh, I'm not. We're not the only. I've, I've talked to many other people who also do not know how to pronounce the name. So that's where we are. Um, so it's just it's a mathematical model that tries to uh, formally describe what it means for a system to protect data and to only allow uh, improvable ways. Only that uh, the the things that are supposed to read the data. 
uh, are the other ones reading it, um, and that it's otherwise and it's being managed in all the appropriate ways. Now, this is a model that came out of MITRE in the 1970s by David Bell and Len Lapadula. And it, it really it, uh, it, it captures the, the kind of the two concepts that I think most people are familiar with, uh, kind of the idea of having a security level, and you know the, it's kind of also combined with a need to know. So there's sure. security levels, which you know everybody's familiar with secret, top secret, classified, although it can really be whatever you want it to be. And then these labels, additional labels that get attached to it that um, can be used to further restrict, you know, based on categories or you know, whatever, uh, who can who can see the information. And uh, we chose this model not really because you know I, uh, it's the not not to say that it's the best model, but it's a well known model. Uh, and it was one of the first models. I think everybody pretty much in, understands what it's about. And it was really meant to be more of a, a case study of how would you map this kind, this family of, mo- uh, of, of, of problems of security to ADL. And there's a, even though it's a, sim- a reasonably simple model, it turns out it, there's a lot of complicated issues that were involved. Um, that we hope are transferable to in the future if a different model was being being applied it could could uh, assist in that in that development um, so, and so we're used to the those two concepts the security level and the uh, need to know being applied to people right that's the uh, that's the thing that people are most familiar with is if you have the security level and you as that person have a need to know you can get access to something here what we're talking about is actually getting into automation in terms of the software being kind of the entity that needs to know and has a security level and so that's that's the piece to me that's really fascinating is how do you determine that a piece of software an element of the software that's trying to access data access data has that need to know right so it's interesting the model itself is is very uh it just talks in terms of subjects which are and objects and so subjects are things that consume information and objects or data and they could be anything um now obviously it was developed in the context of computers specifically um but I mean, it's easy to think of, um, you know, people and a library. Uh, and in fact, I give I have a footnote where I give an example of of using books and notebooks, um, where the books are are the objects. So it's it's really quite agnostic. And in fact, something can have both roles. Something can be both a, ah. a, a subject and an object, depending on how it's it's being used in. In the system, and what's even I was actually wasn't going to say this, but it, since we went down this path, you can actually have pieces of the model as objects in the model itself. Um, so when we talk about software, people love recursion. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so when we talk about you know modifying access control lists in a file system, the the they're both they both are part of the model okay. because they influence what fi- you know which files can be accessed and how, but they also are controlled by the model because you need to control who can change the control lists. Ah. So that, okay. I, that I think was kind of a, an interesting. Uh, so what I'm taking thing. from this is that that assignment of need to know uh, object and subject, uh, you know, security level are not as simple as they may seem on the surface. And that's one of the reasons that we want a rich language like AADL to be involved in managing some of the accesses that are uh, provided by the model, because it's not just a simple if this, then that. Uh, we've got recursive issues. We've got 
subject equals object issue. We've got a lot of different things that we have to deal with. So we need a rich language for dealing with that, which AADL is the richest language that, that I know of, um, you know, in being able to describe the context and the behavior of the software that we want to happen. So given that, um, you, you recently talked in a technical report and a blog post, thank you, um, in this area uh, about security in particular and the 11 rules for ensuring a security model. And let's talk about what those 11 rules are, or at least a sampling of what those are, and sort of what is it that those contribute to being able to leverage a model like the Lapidula Lapadula model in, in modeling that um, engineers are doing? So before I discuss our rules, uh, I do need to point out, so uh, within the build up a dual model, there are kind of two basic properties that need to be enforced. And these influence are where our rules come from. One is called the simple security property, and it corresponds to the um, a problem of assuring that you have the right access level. Uh, so it basically says, right, any any object you touch needs uh, needs to be within the realm of what you're allowed to touch. So, and this is regulated in the model by having every subject is labeled with a security. They call it a security label. It's really it's like the pair of of a security level with a set of categories so it could be like for example top secret and you know uh f22 right so you have to be allowed to look at f22 information and have the top secret clearance level for example and so these labels pretty much everything has a label subjects have a label to say what they're allowed to look at objects have a label that says what's required to look at them. So that, uh, again, so, so that's the simple security property. And then there's a second more uh, property that they call the star property. And it's designed to control kind of information leakage. So um, just controlling that, ever, that you can only touch things you're allowed to touch isn't sufficient because if you're for example, touching a high-level object and a low-level object, you do not want to copy data from the high-level object into the low-level object. You need to contain and, and set a boundary on right. what is the object that you're allowed to access. Right. So the, the star property is a rule that's basically says you can't do that. It says you know, if information can only flow to a higher level. Okay. Um, which intuitively everybody nods their head and says, yes, of course, now that you said that, that makes sense. But in fact, um, that's often, uh, in the real world, that is too restrictive. And so then there's this caveat of the trusted, they call it the trusted subject, um, okay. and this originally applied and that to is a whole can of worms of its own we have other podcasts on right. How, why, why do we trust it well that's that's a separate topic but the uh, it was originally designed for things like you know the, the operating system scheduler you know which needs to be allowed to kind of touch everything but you, has received significant enough scrutiny in its development you hope that uh it's not going to mess anything up. In Fair our enough. context, we're more interested in using the idea of being trusted for um, enabling operations such as um, data obfuscation. So, like, if you want to take, um, you know, if you have a component that's going to scrub data, right? You can take a high resolution image that may be very classified. If you lower the, the, the resolution, right. you can make it less classified. So, uh, I mean, so that involves high level data flowing towards a, a lower security level. The, the star property would normally not allow that. But in this case, it's, we're going to 
this kind of operation we would call trusted. Or another kind of trusted operation would be to encrypt data so you can actually put it over a lower level channel. Right. Um, so those are kind of some real world operations that that need to be escaped uh, from the system. And oh, as an anecdote, interesting anecdote, when I, it, why is the star property called the star property? Which I remember when I was reading this 15 years ago, I was like, that's a strange name. There must be a story to it, but it wasn't, wasn't indicated anywhere uh, in, the, in the document I was reading. But I did, uh, when I revisited uh, in the last year to, to write the tech report, I found uh, 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 David Bell had written a, f- uh, a number of years ago kind of a retrospective uh, article on, on, on this model where he revealed uh, the secret to the name, which was that when he was presented it to, to La Padula in a meeting, he didn't know what to call it. So he kind of wrote star property as as the placeholder and he said we have, need to come up with a better name or we're going to get stuck with his name and they never came up with a better name and that's what what the world is stuck with now okay we, there there are little bits like that you know like where did the term bug come from and and things like that 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 are that for the for the community that's very deeply into the software stuff is is are actually really fun things to know Um, So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, All right. So back to the 11 rules. So we've got, we've got simple properties, we've got the star properties. And so I'm, I'm imagining that the rules are about how you configure those properties and manipulate those um, to create your own security models. With an ADL, I came up with this set of rules um, that uh, basically have to do with you can kind of look at it from either two directions, either how you can check that a model is in good shape, or you can look at it really as constraints on the design of the model. It's really okay. two sides of the same same. And, and we use AADL in both ways. So you want to have both branches available to people. And uh, so there it's really like, so in, you can think of it really as constraining the model so that you can guarantee that the simple security property and the star property uh, make sense in in the system design. Okay. And uh, so I also thought it was interesting that uh, we have 11 rules and their first big application of this model was to Multics. Uh, So that really shows you how old the model is. Um, And they, when they applied it to Multics, they came up with a set of uh, kernel primitives that were kind of had the same role. Was if you stuck to using these primitives, then everything would be in conformance with the model. And they also came up with eleven. So I don't know something. something about the magic that. of eleven. Um, all right. So we. The first set of rules that we have, there's actually the simple security property turns out not to be so simple because it actually spawns six of our rules. Oh, wow. Um, That's mainly, it's mainly because of the hierarchical nature of the modeling uh, with an ADL, um, which, you know, in general is a great benefit of how it allows you to design the system, Um, but it does... Um, make for some complicated, more complicated relationships that need to be checked. So I'll start off by saying the first thing we need to do is present the security labels with an ADL. And that's reasonably simple to do. We just make use of the ADL, a property mechanism. Uh, So we have a, a pair of properties that can be used to express the security level and the set of categories. And so we just make sure that everything that we're interested in has these property associations applied to them. And we also need to know in our world what are objects and what are subjects. Um, 
Again, the subjects being the kind of active participants within the model, those that manipulate the data. And so in ADL, that's it's pretty, pretty clear that that would be the components themselves. Um, and the data is more, uh, a little more challenging because the, the data is not really explicit so much in ADL. Uh, you can have these data components, but that's just really a place where data lives. Uh, the data itself really doesn't exist at all. It just floats through the system. In the, uh, so we have to use the features of the components as kind of proxies for the data because that's where all the data comes in and out of the components. Uh, so we're going to label components, the ADL properties to make them subjects. And we're going to label the features uh, with ADL with the same properties, uh, and those will be the the data objects that need to be um, controlled. Okay. So that said, the so the first rule we get, uh, which derives from a simple security property, is that the security labels we annotate on the features must be within the bounds of the security label of a, the component whose feature is it is. Uh, okay. It's so another way, right? So the security label of a component has to be greater than the security label of each of its features. Right. And, that, and that's a basic property of security a, in a hierarchy. And that's system. really the same basic principle we're now going to just keep enforcing in different places. Um, so, again, because ADL is so kind of uh, layered and uh, enables a lot of different hierarchical containment. The next thing we look at is, well, how can features be hierarchical? Well, we have this thing called a feature group, which is really just a blob of features. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to kind of apply this all the way down. So we now say, well, the security label we gave the feature group as a feature needs to be greater than the security labels of all its subfeatures. And again, I didn't expect that that's not really a surprising result but it's just kind of following not surprising through. but necessary i mean a lot of the these foundational rules are things that people know about but when we move from um, a space into where we're automating there those simple rules are often the ones we forget that, that, right. that I mean, this sort of basis that we all assume is happening we can't assume that we have to tell the models to check for that right and now, kind of in a similar sense, uh, we can have you know the components themselves in the system can be are hierarchically defined to have subcomponents. So we can have a system. System contains processes. The processes contain threads. Uh, and, and again, um, now the original model that we're this Bell Alpadula model doesn't directly consider hierarchical. Uh, composition in this way, um, but I don't think it's a big, it's not a big stretch to extend it. Uh, if you just consider right, that a subcomponent, it's doing work on behalf of its container. Okay. So um, you, it's easy to argue that, well, then whatever it does, its container needs to be allowed to do. So again, you get kind of it's it, it's not really a, again not a deep realization, but you kind of need to take that step, and so let's say that okay now the containers uh, have to its security level has to be uh, greater than the security level a little you know at least as great as as all the security levels of all subcomponents. Now its subcomponents can be have can be more specific if right. they have a smaller security level based on whatever it is they need to do but the 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 higher level aggregate needs to be allowed to do everything yeah. so one of the things I, I you know the containerization um, aspect of current software architecture wasn't even conceived of in the way that we think of it in the 70s so it's actually very um, comforting 
in some ways that this model actually accommodates this evolution in how we think about things, even though it was designed and conceived prior to that kind of, of mechanism being in place. So that's actually very cool. Right. I agree. I, I think it's very, um, it really shows off, like, I mean, like I said, the model, the way it's defined, it's very agnostic in general about how it defines things. And it's very mm -hmm. flexible. Like I, you know, like I said, even allowing pieces of itself to be controlled by itself. Yeah. Um, that, so it's it's very it's definitely refreshing that it just kind of adapts. And the 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 one part that's a little more I think interesting kind of semantically within ADL is how we deal with the uh, subprogram calls, which is our, the next tool that I have because subprogram calls in ADL are a little bit weird in that you define a component to be the subprogram okay and <clears throat> but when you model a call within a within a thread right that's kind of it's an instantiation almost of of the subprogram you can and it depend and this adl semantics provide a variety of well, the standard provides a variety of semantics, I should say, that of where that program gets executed. And it, it's very, it, it, because ADL provides kind of a couple of different ways of, of making it, like you can be importing the subprogram from another, another process. Uh, you can have it within your own process. You can be getting it, uh, from some supplied library somewhere, and so depending on exactly how you 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 set up the, the linkage within the, the ADL model, the the subprogram is actually going to be executed by a, a different device. So it could sometimes be executed by the thread that's making the call, but it might also be executed in the address space of a different thread because you can be modeling a remote procedure call. It could be uh, running off in, you know, a device driver somewhere. So that, uh, it, the what's interesting it is relevant from the point of view of of the security model because the you have to make sure you apply the correct security. Sure. Uh, you have to identify the correct subject that is accessing the right. the, the, the data. And you want to constrain that. You don't want uh, a library that you don't have security information known about to be allowed to be executed within a secure container, just as a very simple example. Right. So, so the fact that you can have these, um, that the that ADL can handle that kind of of rule is actually very useful for making secure models. And so, this needs to be a separate rule from our previous kind of hierarchy rule because these subprograms the point is the subprograms don't respect the containment hierarchy their, their semantics come from somewhere yeah. else so uh, i mean the rule is simply that you know the the subprogram call uh the security label is just that the, the security label of the component that executes the subprogram must be greater than the data that it accesses but the right. trick here is that you need to use the ADL semantics to determine what that what that component is. Uh, that that's kind of the most that's kind of I think of all the rules we have that's kind of the most semantically deep of all of the because of the uh, the complications involved in, in subprograms. But it's it's useful that um, that we've we that we're addressing that kind of semantic complexity because the reality of the software that many of our customers build is that, you know, they're accessing data from here and from here and from here to create, you know, a composite picture of something. And those are, those are all threat points in, in terms of, do I have, you know, the right pairing of level and need, you know, while I'm composing. And then of course, as I, as I do the composition. So, 
um, being able to model that is one of the things that makes modeling useful so that I can make choices. This is where the design comes into play, right? Is, is if I have these different sources, I may decide that this source over here, I am never going to be able to verify you know, its security level. So I can't use that source. I have to find another source you know, for doing this. And that's a very useful thing to find out before um, you know, I right. actually do coding. And that's, that's one of the things I love about AADL is that ability to you know, tease out some of these really pretty esoteric problems, but ones that are very, very important when you get into security and safety. Um, you know, you can also apply, I'm sure, the 11 rules for, um, you know, safety very similarly. That's another blog. <laughs> so next, the next, I, I, there's, the next pair of rules um, uh, also kind of applies to more of this, kind of more of a real world uh, problems uh, where we deal with ADL, uh, what we call the ADL bindings. Okay. Uh, uh, people, if you're familiar with ADL, you know that there's really kind of two categories of components. Uh, there's software components such as processes and threads, and then there's the same model will have kind of hardware components, say memory and device and processor and uh, or a bus, um, <clears throat> and then you're allowed to go between them. Uh, by making what they in ADL what you, they call a binding, where you say this process is running on this uh, this uh, CPU, and this uh, other process is running on another CPU, and when they exchange data, a data is actually going over this bus, but when it's uh, communicating to you know this other subsystem, it's actually going to go over you know another bus. So you're allowed to to see how you know kind of the the virtual uh, exists on top of of the physical, and again this has security implications because if you know you you don't want to send your your top secret data over you know a network that isn't rated for that kind of communication, uh, right. and so you need to you need to have this modeled in your system. Uh, so again, so in ADL, we're going to have that you've applied security labels to, to software components and to the hardware components. And so then we just have this set of rules that really make sure that the, the bindings respect the, the security rules as well. And again, they're going to be the, the obvious rules that when you whatever you're bound to needs to have right. permission to do whatever it is that you want to do. Um, again, the, the, the real exercise was in identifying that this is a potential uh, problem within, within the you know, model as it applies to ADL. So, and so this is another area where AADL is different from some of the other modeling tools that we see that are very software centric, even though AADL definitely has software uh, centricity as part of how it's built and, and, and how the language is set up. It also accommodates hardware as, as a real thing and does allow physical, um, you know, modeling of physical aspects so that we can look at, I mean, to me, that the real key to system integration is understanding your hardware and software together embedded systems this is this is the problem is the hardware and software integration so the fact that we can apply these kinds of security rules to the hardware part of the model not just the software part of the model gives it a lot of power in my mind i agree so those are six rules and so again so the simple property turns out to have spawned six rules the more kind of intellectually complicated star property only gives us one rule in ADL, which I, is kind of interesting. Um, but uh, but I'll bet it's a doozy. Well, it's a uh, it's, it's a simple rule, but I will say, to v figuring out how to deal with it was not. I mean, it was, there was a lot of work in figuring it out, and then it's you know, 
once you did it, you realize, wow, that was kind of not surprising. I should have realized that originally, but uh, it was uh, it was more. I, I remember at the time, I I had many false starts as to how it should be represented mm-hmm. before I kind of had the epiphany, uh, which is that so. And I kind of already hinted at this in the way I spoke about the star property earlier. The basic point of the star property is that it, information can only flow from high level from to a higher level from a lower level. Right. And I'm going to I'm here. I've chosen the word flow on purpose uh, because one of the big features of ADL is that it allows for modeling at an abstract level of data flows. Um, right. So this is a big, uh, uh, my big realization was that, well, if we're going, we just need to look at the flows, <laughs> uh, which uh, <clears throat> sh- uh, should seem obvious, uh, but it really, it, uh, especially when you're new to ADL, if you're not, uh, it's not a way you're necessarily used to thinking. Um, gotcha. So, right, so the rule is basically when we, uh, for each flow in a component, uh, the security level of the destination of the flow needs to be higher than higher. the course mm-hmm. of the flow. And, you know, that that's it. Um, so this is one of those rules that is simple but not easy. Right, and it's actually, I mean, I say that's it, but uh, this is one of the catches because, you know, um in general the flows are not really a required component of a ADL model and uh it's just kind of a almost in kind of an app the flow itself is almost kind of an application of the model because you're 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 marking off paths of interest uh but you're not you know it depends on what problem you're trying to solve what are those paths of interest? So you may only mark a subset of the flows that are pot- are possible within the model, or that you know. So uh, in this case, we're for for this application, we're really kind of requiring that all flows would be specified, and that Which is again is- being cognizant of the threat space. You know, the, the threat actors are going to take advantage of all the possible flows, not just the ones that are the, I'll call it the sunshine path. Um, and that awareness is part of what makes a security model like this important. And so this is, I mean, uh, I'm going to jump ahead. I, one of the, the future questions was what are some kind of impediments to the to the uh, sure. deployment? And th- this would be one of the stumbling blocks that, that I'll identify um, uh, because you know it's it's bur- it would be it's as if, especially if you have a complex model it would be pretty burdensome to identify all the flows even though you know it's it's understandable why you would need them uh, and this is this is a point unfortunately this is a point where the the analyzability of ADL and the presence of toolkits such as Osate uh, come in because you can, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about it now, but uh, we, we outline in, in the tech report kind of a process by which uh, a tool could assist in identifying flows and, right. and lessen the burden on the modeler for, for this particular aspect. And that's actually part of the importance of these rules because they are – rules that work together with your pipeline and with with the automation that you're intending to use so that that automation supports understanding all of the security aspects of the model it doesn't just it, it's like well that one's too hard you know for me as a human so i'm going to ignore it the mo- the automation can look at data differently and analyze things um, you know more robustly so that we can get a better picture of where the security gaps are and you know, there's value just in the exercise of finding the flows. There's value because you can imagine, mm-hmm. 
real, you know, uh, the uh, uh, an automated process turning up flows you wouldn't have considered, and you're thinking, oh, well, I did not intend for that to be, yeah, to be the case at all. I don't, I don't want it to even be a potential for that to exist. Okay, are there some other drawbacks that people should be aware of? Um. I think that was the main one that's really related to this model. I would say the uh, the other issues would be those in general related to to modeling, which is that sure. you need to make sure that the actual system that is constructed is true to the model, that there's a correspondence between the two, and that unfortunately is a whole larger set of issues um uh but you know <laughs> you know and, and i don't i don't want to you know and it, it is easy to become discouraged when you think about how you know how how to make that the process work but i i i you know i don't I, I encourage people not to be discouraged because as we've discussed you know just the process of 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 producing the model at least is going to make you aware of things you wouldn't have considered right. by kind of by, by having more formalized you know steps you know you can see you know you know i don't i don't want to belittle it by calling it a checklist but kind of you know it i more make it i more analogize it to a checklist, like having a checklist, by going through the process, by by at least attempting to model some aspects of the system, you're going to be asking yourself questions that you know you just are easy to overlook. And right. even if you can't guarantee 100 percent that you know you built identical to what you've you've planned, you've hopefully you've learned things revealed that- some yeah. information that you you would not have otherwise and it's right. informed your your process down the line or you've learned things that will prevent you from uh adding in vulnerabilities that you're going to have to deal with later um, right. and later is always more expensive so it, it saves you in that you know even the, even modeling that is challenging to do gives you that kind of learning Right, and, and we're seeing a lot of that as people move into this space. Don't want the the perfect to become the the enemy of the good in this, right. in this case. There you so go. A little bit is 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 beneficial. So, if I am an engineer um, that is actually using AEDL and I want to apply this approach to my security, what kinds of resources do we have available for them? Where should where should they start in figuring out how to apply these 11 rules to their AADL models? Uh, well, first I would encourage them to take a look at the technical report. It has there you go. all the details in it, and that can be found off the SEI webpage. And of course, we also would have to recommend that they get a copy of the OSATE toolkit, which they can download from OSATE which is O-S-A-T-E dot org. And we'll have that in our transcript. So if you didn't catch it, we'll give it to you. And um, we are uh, developing a plugin based on the, uh, these te- you know, what's described in the technical report uh, so that there will be analysis within Asate to support this. And um, otherwise they can always... Uh, Try, uh, contact us by sending an email to info at sei.cmu.org, uh, uh, sorry, .edu, uh, and uh, we'll be happy to try to work with you. Okay. And for you yourself, what what is next for you in this area of work? I can there's I, I hear you talk about the plug-in. Um, I imagine you're working on that, but what other things are you working on related to this? Um, just well within the realm of security, um, we have the uh, there's a security annex being developed for the ADL language. Uh, this would be this is mainly a set of standardized uh, properties 
that can be used within ADL to define uh, security levels and uh, kind of encryption and authentication schemes. And uh, really, I would say that this work is kind of one of the earliest consumers of this, this annex. It, it, um, it relies on, on some of the properties defined uh, within it. Uh, so that's, that's in the pipeline. Uh, it's not a, it's not standardized yet, but it's in the, it's in the works. And so I would imagine more work to come out of, um, of that line where we look at how to apply the annex to some more real world problems. Um, so you'll be busy for a while. Yes, I will. When it comes to security, we're all going to be busy because every time we think we've got it nailed, some new threat comes in that we've got to adapt to. And But I'm very encouraged that this bell Lapadula model seems to have the robustness and the flexibility to adapt to the new ways we're doing things and to some of the new uh, ways that we have to characterize threats. So that's actually very encouraging that we have a foundational model that is going to allow us to adapt to many different cases, not just a single one. So I want to thank you for joining me today. It was really nice to talk to you. It's been several years since we've been able to have this kind of conversation. And I really appreciate that you came back to us and uh, have been able to help progress this work. The AADL work is some of our more complicated work that we've done at the SEI, but in terms of safety and security, that modeling approach um, has got so many benefits to it. And I, I'm really pleased to see that we're continuing to refine and evolve um, the utility of the security and safety aspects of this. So I wanna thank you again. I want to remind our viewers that uh, the things that we talked about today in terms of resources will be included as links in the transcript and uh, during that we mentioned during the podcast. And I want to thank you all again for joining us today. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.